Hello and welcome everyone. I'm going to start off with a song lyric and it's Should I Stay or Should I Go Now? That's from a back in the day song from The Clash. And if you're a potential home buyer, you may be thinking the same thing when it comes to purchasing a new home. And you may be thinking, yes, I should buy, or no, let me stay put for a while, or I just don't know. Well, let me tell you, you are not alone. Before I go into why you're not alone, allow me a moment to introduce myself in this webinar. I'm Jennifer Witter, the CEO and founder of The Borland Group and the moderator for today's Facebook Live event, thinking of buying a home in New York City? Well, here is what you need to know. Featuring three of the city's top experts in real estate. Whether you are renting, looking to buy, or you're already an owner looking to move into a new home, the real estate market has been of late shall we say, confusing. At the beginning of 2022, it was a seller's market with high sales prices, ferocious bidding wars, and mortgage rates that were, according to Freddie Mac, at 3.2% for a 30-year mortgage and at 2.43% for a 15-year mortgage. Well, times have changed. Inflation, Increasing talk of a slowing housing market, rising mortgage rates have all had an impact on buyers' decisions. And we're flooded with information that can be confusing and overwhelming for most buyers. And that's where this webinar steps in. Today, our speakers are here to clarify exactly what is happening in the market for buyers, answer your questions, and provide some much needed clarity on buyer related topics. Their primary goal, and let me underscore this, is to provide information that you need to assist you in your housing decision. We want this to be interactive. So please feel free to drop questions in the comments section and they'll be answered throughout the session. You'll also see the experts' email addresses in the comments sections, and feel free to reach out to them directly after this talk for more information. They are here for you. Now, let me introduce our formidable group of experts. First is Benjamin Dixon. Ben is the co-founder of the Mackay Dixon team at Douglas Element, and together with his team has sold more than one billion, that's with a B, dollars, in residential real estate in New York City and the Hamptons. In addition to being a real estate advisor, Ben is a CPA and received his MBA from the University of California, Berkeley Haas School of Business. Those degrees and his experience in the financial investment world allows him to provide deeper insights into the financial nuances of purchasing a home for his clients. Ben has been featured in Bloomberg, The Wall Street Journal, Bankrate.com, Go, Go Bankingrates.com, and The Cooperator. The Mackay Dixon team, by the way, is the sponsor for today's talk. Next is Allison Gaston. She is the senior counsel at Chase Perlowitz Luftig LLP, the real estate transaction group. She represents buyers as well as sellers and lenders in all facets of transactional real estate. Allison is best known for her solution space legal approach and razor sharp attention to detail. She is a dedicated advocate for her clients and she's an expert negotiator who effectively navigates the stickier points and guides clients to the finishing line with ease. Having been selected for Super Lawyers Rising Star from 2016 to 2021, Allison is consistently rated a top real estate attorney in New York City. And last but definitely not least is Shimon Batesh. Shimon founded Everett Abstract Services, LLC, a national title insurance company in October 2007. Prior to establishing Everest, Shimon founded Batesh & Associates PLLC, one of New York's leading residential real estate law firms. He closed over 1,000 transactions a year, representing developers and private individuals, 
as well as serving as closing agent and counsel to several national mortgage banks. His legal background and over 20 years of experience in the real estate industry is beneficial in having a full understanding of the business and legal aspects of complex deals. Jamon specializes in New York high-end residential transactions and as lead counsel at Everest has led the underwriting of several billion dollars worth of insured transactions. Shimon graduated from SUNY Binghamton and Brooklyn Law School. Welcome everyone. Ben, let's start with you. Now to provide context to this conversation, let's start with what's happening in the market. Can you give us an overview? Sure, that is the question I am getting asked the most right now. And clearly we have a lot of market headwinds and external forces. Everyone's heard about rising interest rates. We know about the extremely volatile stock market right now. And we've been talking about inflation for the first time in decades. So a lot of is happening and changing in the market. I think the real key thing to focus on is that we still have strong underlying demand. We have, our phones are ringing. People are looking to move to New York City, live in New York City. And on the flip side, we don't have a whole lot of supply. We have about average. It isn't stacking up like it is in some parts of the country. So the market right now, while we were certainly in a seller's market in the earlier part of the year before rates went up, when people were willing to pay a little more for a home and lock in those rates, not in that market anymore, but we're in a balanced market right now. Okay. Well, let's go through a couple of hypothetical situations. I'm a buyer. Let's pretend that. I see a lot in the press that buyers are thinking of sitting out the market, especially with interest rates rising. Now, this can be an opportunity because fewer buyers mean fewer bidding wars, and sellers are now more motivated because there are fewer buyers. What should I be doing? What should I be thinking about from a buyer's perspective? Sure. Well, you know, they say that fortune favors the bold, and you do have to be bold right now when you're reading these headlines to go and make a new purchase. But you also have to remember that sellers are reading those same headlines and those headlines are making them nervous and they're making them more negotiable. So right now, as a buyer, you have less competition, like you mentioned, Jennifer, and you've got more motivated sellers. That's a great formula to get a really great purchase price. So buyers should be thinking about finding the right home for them, being aggressive, getting the right price. Yes, they're going to have a higher payment because of higher interest rates, but those rates will subside and you can always refinance a mortgage. So buyers should be thinking about what their budget is, where they want to be living and getting pre-approved. That makes us ready to strike and find the right opportunity in this market. Okay. Now, if I'm a first time home buyer and frankly feeling a bit overwhelmed and discouraged, what do you advise and what does the process look like for this group? So I would say all buyers, first time, second time, third time, really be thinking about the location and where you want to live and really understanding your budget, which might be a little different right now, giving rates if you're financing. So really, if you've also purchased before outside of Manhattan, think of yourself as a first timer here. Everything is a little bit different in Manhattan, which is why we have these experts on with us that help us through the transaction. And when you should think about um, the process here, uh, it is different than everywhere else. So we'll go out, we'll look for the right home for you. We'll go see homes in person. Once we find that home, we're going to make an offer. That's a simple email from me to the seller's agent. It's going to have the headline terms like price and closing timeline that are going to end up in the contract. As soon as we come to a meeting of the minds, a deal sheet goes out to somebody like Allison or Shimon. The seller's attorney is going to start drafting that contract. Your attorney is going to start doing the due diligence on the building for you. They'll review financial statements. They'll review board minutes. And once we come to a contract that's ready to be signed, you'll put a 10% deposit down. That is when you're committed to purchasing the home. And that's when the seller's committed to you. They can't take any other offers at that point. We'll then work with you on a board package for your co-op or condo purchase, get the financing in order, submit all of that. Once we get an approval from the building is when we move to the closing table. And that's when we close the deal and you get your keys. Okay, and you'll be guiding your client through all of that. All the way through. That generally takes about 60 to 90 days from the day 
by your contract to the day that he's there. Okay, it's always good to have an expert holding your hand. <laughs> the New York Times just did an article entitled, The Housing Market is Worse Than You Think. Yikes. And one of the reasons behind that thinking, according to the New York Times, is the big jump in housing prices. Then do you think the market is as bad as the Times reports? Well, Jennifer, in short, yes. Uh, but that article is really referring to the rest of the country or the country as a whole. And you don't want to get caught up in national headlines when you're thinking about local real estate. So nationally, we did see markets that went up 25, 30, 40 percent. They have a ways to fall. That didn't happen in Manhattan. We saw prices come down during COVID and then we regrain that ground. We saw prices go up a bit because uh, fear of rising interest rates. We saw that now being pulled back down. But we're talking five and 10 percent moves. And we're basically back now to pre-pandemic pricing. So while things may have felt very volatile and a lot of things were happening in the market and it might have felt overwhelming, Manhattan stayed relatively stable compared to the rest of the country. So yes, I think the rest of the country is heading into some tough times with respect to real estate pricing, but I do believe in Manhattan where we might see a little bit of pressure, it'll be nothing like the rest of the market. And if you're thinking about buying here, you need to be focused here. Pretty interesting, and I appreciate your honesty in that. Um, let's turn to the elephant in the room, money. Earlier this month, the Fed announced another big boost in interest rates, raising it three quarters of a percentage point. That's the sixth time this year. Then you're a certified public accountant, you hold an MBA, you have a lot more financial knowledge than the average real estate advisor. How is this move already impacting mortgage rates and financing? Well, uh, they're going up. So there, one thing to remember here, though, is that the Fed rate is an overnight rate, right? It's about as short as it can be. And mortgages are generally 10 years to 30 years. So there's not a one-to-one -one ratio here. It does not mean that things just jump 75 basis points for buyers. Uh, and buyers really need to speak to their mortgage banker. They need to understand what their interest rate is. What you see in the headlines are often Fannie Mae rates, which are non-jumbo mortgages. Most mortgages here in Manhattan are jumbo mortgages, mm -hmm. um, which have a lower rate. So uh, be careful of what you're reading in the newspapers. Again, you need to understand what is going to be applicable to your situation in particular. And there are some strategies we can use to bring those payments down. What are some of those strategies? Well, I would say the first one that's very effective, if we were considering a 30-year mortgage before at an interest rate that we could have gotten a year ago, we now might look at a 10-year interest-only mortgage. Those payments with the current rates are going to be about the same, so your buying power remains about the same. Yes, we're doing interest-only as opposed to amortizing, but during the first couple of years of an amortizing mortgage, we actually amortize a very small percentage, and you can always refinance that mortgage in two or three years when the rates abate. So it's a great way to maintain your purchasing power and also get a great purchase price now. And then as rates subside, go for a lower payment then. Uh, we also can buy down rates. So if we have a very motivated seller for every quarter point, that, sorry, for every point that they might pay down on the mortgage, we'll see a quarter point of relief on your payment. So that's another way that we can try to bring payments down but the real key here, talk to multiple mortgage lenders, talk to multiple to make sure you see what they're offering. They're reacting to this market too and offering different products than they were a year ago. Uh, and that could really uh, help you out. So are you an advocate of date the rate, marry the house? I absolutely am. Let's go and find the right house now, right home now, when there are less buyer competition and more motivated sellers and you'll feel like a genius in three years when you uh, when you refinance that mortgage. Okay, last question. How is inflation impacting home prices? Well, academically, inflation, uh, real estate is an inflationary asset. So just by definition, you will see home prices rising due to inflation. However, we haven't been talking about inflation for decades because we really haven't had meaningful inflation. So right now, in this moment, it's creating uncertainty and uncertainty is usually bad for pricing and bad for markets. 
So there is a buying opportunity right now to use the word inflation to make us sellers concerned, quite honestly, and get a great buy and then watch your asset grow as opposed to the cash in your bank account be worth less due to inflation. Okay. Ben, you shared a lot of great information. Now to our viewing audience, please be sure to post your questions, comments in the comments section and our experts will answer them. Now, next up we have Allison. Allison, let's begin with a basic question, but one that needs to be asked. Why do I need an experienced New York City attorney as opposed to using a general or an out of town lawyer? Thanks so much, Jennifer. Um, this is actually a question I've gotten pretty often. You know, a lot of people have that, you know, brick and mortar general attorney that works upstate who, you know, is happy to handle your real New York City real estate transaction. But the thing is, timing is crucial here. I mean, once you have an accepted offer, even with handshake terms, as Ben mentioned, that deal is actually not legally binding until both parties have signed the contract and the buyers put down a 10% deposit. Each day matters. There's always a risk that another possibly better offer could come in and seller could walk away from the deal. By using an experienced New York City real estate attorney, we know all of the management companies. We can do due diligence faster. We also know all of the local real estate attorneys and what kind of provisions they'll want in the contract. We know what the market is here in New York City and what's not. This is really important in a deal because you need to ensure that the attorney you work with knows how to make deals rather than kill deals. In other areas of the state, there are some terms that are market that are just not market here. So if you use an out of area attorney, they may be unknowingly killing your deal by asking for just some unreasonable things. Those are a few reasons. I cannot underscore enough why it is important to have a local attorney working on your deal here, whether it's a New York City attorney for a New York City deal or a Hamptons attorney for a Hamptons deal. It makes all of the difference in making sure that your deal is protected that you've negotiated. Allison, what's the role of a real estate attorney prior to signing the contract? Well, after you've worked with your agent to identify the right property and come to business terms with the seller, the purchase price, the financing terms, the closing period. It's our job to ensure those business terms are accurately reflected in the contract. For example, you may have agreed that you're financing, but we need to make sure that those financing terms are accurately included in the contract. For example, is, is there a financing contingency? We'll negotiate a very common funding contingency to make sure that you're protected in the event you're not able to get a loan commitment letter. New York is a buyer beware state. Mm -hmm. That means that it's up to the buyer to accurately complete due diligence on the property or waive their right to do so. You can't sign the contract and then find out something unsavory about the building's finances and decide to walk away with your 10% deposit. So it's up to us to complete that due diligence. It's, this is absolutely crucial on a deal because it'll, it'll make a difference between signing the contract within a week or two weeks. And in this market, it's really important. For a typical co-op or condo, there are several steps. We'll review the board meeting minutes. A healthy board should be talking about the going on in the building. And we'll see what's been going on for the last several years. The building's financials, are they fiscally solid? We'll want to review the last, at least the last two years to see what they've been spending their money on and if they're budgeting accurately for those expenditures. Depending on the age of the building, we'll see how important the offering plan is. That's a big, thick book that when the building was first converted to a corporate condo, it's all the plans and all the definitions of what makes this building what it is. Our due diligence questionnaire is usually the most critical piece of due diligence. We have a three to four page questionnaire that we submit to the managing agent to ask all about the unit and the building, planned capital improvements, planned increased funds. All of this is important. So you can decide if this is where you wanna place your investment. You know, you talked about due diligence in your response. What are some of the red or pink flags that you see come up in due diligence? No, I'll start by saying that most deals go through smoothly, right? It's where we find a perfect building, but you know, most bumps or hiccups can usually be answered by just asking another question, right? We get one piece of information, we find out more about it, and we see if we can get you to a place where you're comfortable proceeding. However, the whole point of this is to parse out that information, and then it's really up to the client and their appetite for risk or not if they're comfortable going through. 
a, a pretty classic flag that will come up is the low reserve fund in the building, basically mm -hmm. the building savings account. If the building doesn't have any money, you as an, a buyer, an investment investor in the building may be concerned. What if the building needs a new roof? How will that affect me? Well, if the building doesn't have any money, how much will I have to pay out of pocket for it? It can also concern lenders. Um, a building with a history of deficits, assessments, maintenance increases, we'll want to determine why. And is this going to happen again in the future? Or has the building taken some steps recently to, to confront that? So in the future, you're not worrying about paying huge assessments in the near future. Uh, a low owner occupancy level can be a concern for some buyers, not all. Some buyers want a building where it's easy to invest and sublet. Others want one where there are more owners that live there. Um, another pretty common one is if there's one entity that owns too much in the building. Mm -hmm. um, this is very common in, in development, in new developments, where the sponsor, the developer of the building, is still holding on to a good amount. This is mainly a concern because anytime one entity owns a lot, there's a concern, what if they don't pay? If, a, if one person owns 50% of the building, that's half of the building's cost that, this, that they are paying with their monthly common charges. So these are all sorts of areas where we'll look into, and again, we'll find more information. All the goal of making, giving you the opportunity to make an education, educated decision. Really quite interesting. Uh, you can't overlook due diligence. You really need to focus in on it, no matter how much time it takes. What is the real estate attorney's role after the contract is signed? So contract is signed, it's a huge relief for the buyer and seller, it's, it's a celebration. That's the, a huge first hurdle to get through. But once it is signed, it's not over. So at that point, we'll order a title report or a lien search to ensure that the client is getting clean title or clean stock and lease to the property. If there are any liens, these could be mechanics liens if the seller hasn't paid a contractor, tax liens, judgments. We'll work with the title company and the seller's attorney to ensure that they are clean so the buyer doesn't have to deal with these issues when they become owner. Same concept with open work permits or violations. It's not uncommon here that a, we'll have old Department of Building work permits on a unit and we'll have to determine the steps that seller can take to clear that. If the buyer is financing, we're also going to work with the bank attorney through any open loan conditions or items needed. A lot of times there's documents needed or explanations needed at the property so that the lender's underwriter can approve the loan. We really hold your hand throughout the process. There's invariably going to be questions that come up along the way, and that's why you have a team to help you. Okay. Now, no matter how smooth you try to make the process go, wrinkles can and do happen. Um, let's take closings. Um, what are some hiccups that can come up when scheduling the closing and how do you work through them? Well, most contracts have an on or about closing date. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, closing to be on or about 60 days. The on or about language gives both parties a 30 day grace period to close. So in this example, we would be looking to close within a 60 to 90 day period of the executed contract. And as Ben mentioned earlier, that's a pretty typical timeline, especially uh, if you're financing. This range sounds good in theory, but it can cause conflict sometimes if either the buyer needs to close, let's say, to, for an interest rate lock, but the seller's not ready to move. Um, interest rate locks are a common conflict, especially right now when interest rates are rising and some buyers have locked in much lower rates months ago and can cost them to extend that rate. On the flip side, if seller wants to close fast and buyer needs more time because their loan is not clear, even travel schedules can cause an issue in scheduling. New York doesn't allow e-signing. There has to be ink, wet ink notary signatures at the closing table. And sometimes getting all the parties to sit in one room at one time can be tricky. Powers of attorney are, are going to be a, a logical answer to this. Um, allows a party to sign a power of attorney to their attorney so they can sign the closing documents on their behalf. So we don't have to worry about them physically attending the closing. We can also work with our clients to pre-sign documents in some instances, if the lender allows. Um, if the, unfortunately, if the other party will not schedule, um, sometimes we do need to send a time of the essence letter. By sending out that letter, that will then set a firm closing period within 30 days. And we can then hold the other side in default if we really think they're dragging their feet and not scheduling the closing. 
Okay. I know it can be difficult when I was closing my parents' home. Um, it was like herding cats to get everybody um, in the same room. And they were not happy cats, um, all of them. But anyway, thanks so much, Allison. You shared a lot of good information for buyers. Before I move on, I would like to take a quick moment to again thank visitors to today's Facebook webinar Thinking of buying a home in New York City? Here is what you need to know. Featuring three of the city's top experts. We spoke earlier with Benson of the Mackay Dixon team at Beckles Elliman and Allison Gaskin at Chaves Perlitz Luftig LLP. Next up, we have Shimon Batesh, the co-founder of Everest Abstract Services LLC, a national title insurance firm. Hey, Shimon. Hey, Jennifer. Now, I don't think many people know exactly what a title insurance policy is. So can you explain what it is and if a buyer needs to purchase one and why? Sure. Thank you again, Jennifer. So title insurance is a policy that's issued by an underwriter. It's usually an owner's policy and a lender's policy. Uh, the title insurance basically ensures the lender and the owner that they are the rightful owner of the property. And it's also a policy given to insure you against any claims that might come up in the future. Title insurance always protects you against previous acts. Um, and it's very important that one purchases a title insurance policy. A title insurance policy different than a homeless insurance policy or a life insurance policy, which you pay every year. A title insurance policy is a one-time fee. It's paid when you purchase your condo or your home. It's regulated by the state. So one title insurance company charges, the other title company charges as well. It's, it's very, very important that a buyer get a title insurance policy. One thing that people don't know is that when you issue a owner's policy and a lender's policy at the same time, the lender saves actually 70% on the title insurance. So for example, if one takes out a loan and buys a house at the same time, they only pay 30% of the lender's premium. So you're not paying really much more when you're buying an owner's and lender's policy at the same time. I've been practicing for over 20 years and I can say I've maybe had one client not take a title insurance policy. Hmm. It's very important to obtain and highly recommended. Yeah, right. just, just to chime in and add, I, I, I've definitely had clients ask me in the past, like, do I need this? It, it kind of seems abstract to many people. And just to echo, it's, it's absolutely 100% needed. It's something that should never be waived. Interesting. And, and, and just to, uh, what Alice was saying, there are many abstract companies in New York, be it in the city, in Nassau, in Suffolk County. There are only a handful of underwriters. So when you get issued your policy, it comes from an underwriter, not necessarily from the abstract company. So like my company, we underwrite through many underwriters. You want to make sure you get a policy for one of the main underwriters, such as First American, Fidelity, Commonwealth, Stewart, Older Public. These are publicly traded companies, so you're, you're guaranteed that if, God forbid, there's a claim, you have someone backing you that's qualified to back you. That's important. Very important. Um, New York, unless unlike most cities, has a lot of cooperative apartments. Uh, is there title insurance on a co-op and why is this important to know? So that's a great question. So as Allison said before, when one buys a co-op, one usually purchases what's called a lien, lien search. A lien search is different than a title insurance policy because a lien search is more of just for information, what liens are on the property. Most people, when they buy a cooperative, only get a lien search because when you buy a cooperative, you're buying into shares, into a corporation. So like Allison said, that's why the attorney does due diligence on the, on the corporation, make sure the corporation's standing. A lien church will revere any kind of UCC1s or any kind of liens against the property. There are times where you might want to get a title insurance policy. It's known as an Eagle 9 policy. Many people do not know about this, uh, but it can be a very useful tool. I recommend people taking that when, you have, when you're buying from uh, an estate or you're buying from a trust, there, there might be issues with the stock and lease. There are also many times where a cooperative might require you to get what's called an Eagle 9 policy. Mm -hmm. When you buy, if there's a lost stock and lease, 
uh, they can require it. So sometimes when you purchase a co-op and you take a loan, the bank takes that original stock and lease at the closing. When you go to sell, when you pay off that loan, they will tender that stock and lease back to you. If the bank loses a stock and lease, which unfortunately happens a lot, the co-op might recommend or might make the buyer purchase or the seller purchase what's called an Eagle 9 policy. At that point, you get the policy. It's not as costly as a title insurance policy, but it's still very effective. And that's that's really good. I keep saying that. Really good information, Shimon. Um, what are the closing fees a buyer typically pays on a transaction? So co-op and condos or condo and house are, are different. You have your title insurance policy, uh, which you're going to pay. It's basically the premiums on title insurance are about 4000 for every million. Then you have made some searches, which cost anywhere from $500 to $1,000. And then you have recording fees, which can range anywhere from $500 to $1,000 as well. There's also mortgage tax. Mortgage tax in, in the city is 1.8% under $500,000, and it's 1.95% over $500,000. There's also mansion tax. That's a tax of any anything over $1 million. Uh, you pay 1%. And there's also the sole tax. A supplemental tax, which was issued in New York a couple of years ago. When you buy a condo, the condo will also require you to pay certain condo fees, um, be it a move-in fee, a um, application fee. Um, and usually the bank will also require you to pay fees. Most banks, their fees range from $2,000 to, to $3,000 without any points. Um, and, and then you also have your attorney's fee. Uh, when you buy a co-op, the co-ops are much cheaper. Uh, when you buy a co-op, you do pay mansion tax, but you do not pay mortgage tax. Because again, you're not buying real property, you're buying shares in a stock and lease. So a cooperative is usually much cheaper than a, a condo or a house purchase when it comes to closing fees for a buyer. Okay. Yeah, and Jennifer, I think that's important to point out. We point out that to a lot of our buyers. A lot of buyers come and say, I want a condo. And then when you start talking them through the pros and cons, a condo or a co-op might be the right thing for them. And mm -hmm. one of the pros of a co-op is that you're not paying the mortgage recording tax and generally don't have a title insurance policy. So there are lower closing costs on the way in. Um, any building can have what they call a flip tax on the way out, which could be very small. One month of common charges might be in a condo to upwards of two or two and a half percent on a co-op. So sometimes they do get you on the back end, uh, mm -hmm. but that's diligence we do up front and information that the attorney would be confirming before you're signing a contract. Okay. Thank you, Ben. And Shimon, anything that you would highlight uh, regarding uh, title insurance? I, I think that's one of the least understood aspects of this process. It's, it's, it's just very important that you purchase it. Um, yeah, I, I can't stress it more. Yes, while there's not many claims in New York uh, when it comes to title insurance, you know, it's a one-time fee. So if you think about it, if you're buying a million dollar uh, condo or million dollar home, you're paying basically five, four to $5,000 for title insurance that will protect you for the rest of your life. It's a one-time fee. Uh, you'd, you'd, be, you'd be foolish not to take it. Um, mm -hmm. As the prices go up, the title insurance comes down a little bit. Um, it's a one-time fee. It's good forever. Um, you have to take it. <laughs> Yeah, I would, I would, I think Allison said it too, but I would underscore Shimon. I've only had one deal uh, where the buyer paid cash and didn't take title insurance, and it kind of shocked everyone on that deal. Um, I'm sure Allison has, a, I'm sure Allison has a crazy indemnity for her clients if one ever says that they don't want to take a title insurance policy because, you know, you, you don't realize people buy homeowners insurance, you don't even think about it. You're paying two thousand dollars a year, or three thousand, or four or five thousand dollars a year, and it's every year. Odds of there being a fire in your apartment or your home, also minimum. This you pay one time fee, it protects you forever. Um, it's, it's, it's something that's, it's, that's really needed. What's the average very, very big appetite for risk, very big appetite for risk and to be self-insuring yourself to not take a policy. Very, very rare. And especially people have to remember when you're, when you're bought, when you're taking a loan, you're already paying for the lender's policy. There's no way a lender is not going to make you take title insurance. So you're already paying a title insurance. You only have to pay 30% more of the premium for an owner's policy. That's why a couple of years ago, um, they came out with this TRID guidelines, 
where the banks now basically show the difference between buying an owner's policy and a loan policy simultaneously and not getting it. So people really see that it's it's just not worth it not to buy the policy. Very quickly, Shimon, what's the average cost to purchase? Um, it, I would say anywhere between, if you're buying a, a condo or a home, anywhere between four to 6%. Okay. When you're right. taking a mortgage, if you're taking a mortgage, if you're not taking a mortgage, you know, the mortgage tax is almost 2%. So that's a big number. So if you're not, you're not taking a mortgage, um, it'd be a little bit less, but anywhere from four to 6%. Great. Thank you, and, Shimon. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Of, sorry. You go ahead, Jennifer. Sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead. Uh, one thing I wanted to touch on also is uh, as Ben was saying before, it's 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 a it's a very changing environment, and there's ways people can save on mortgage tax and transfer taxes. Um, there's something what's called a purchase SEMA. Um, it's a great tool. I know Allison puts it in her contracts. Um, it's a great tool, especially in this environment where a buyer can save on mortgage tax, a seller can save on estate transfer tax, um, and it's 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 big big savings. And it's not a lot of work. It's really paperwork. Um, it's it's just a, it's it's a good tool to have in your uh, back pocket when you're uh, in this environment. It sounds like an excellent tool. Thank you so much, and thank you again, Benjamin Dixon of the Mackay Dixon team at Douglas Elliman, Allison Gaskin at Chase Hurlitz Luftig LLP and Shimon Batesh of Everest Abstract Services, LLC, for all of your insight that I know will help home buyers in their housing decisions. Finally, thanks to our audiences for attending. We hope you found this discussion of value. Always know that Ben, Allison, and Shimon are here for you. As mentioned, you can find their contact information in the comments section. Feel free to reach out to them at any time. I'm Jennifer Witter, and have a great rest of your day.